All right, the live stream has started, so y'all are good to go. Thank you. Sounds good. The 1AC has been sent. Can I receive verbal or nonverbal confirmation from everyone that it's received and everyone's ready to start? Perfect. In that case, I'll begin. Contention one is inherency. Mandatory minimum sentencing laws strip power from judges and impose harsh punishments. Despite reform, the structure of mass incarceration remains. Bar count 19. Congress passed the most significant changes in the federal criminal justice system. The CCCA created new mandatory minimum sentences. The Sentencing Reform Act eliminated indeterminate sentencing, and the ACCA fitted an aims to increase punishments and strip discretion from judges by establishing mandatory minimum punishment. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act imposed mandatory minimum sentences and introduced the 100 to 1 ratio between crack and powder cocaine. Additional mandatory minimums imposed tough sanctions on recidivists as part of a three-strikes law. While Congress has passed modest reforms, the fundamental architecture remains. Mandatory minimums play an outsized role in filling federal prisons. More than half of the individuals in federal prison were convicted of an offense carrying a mandatory minimum sentence. Thus, the plan. The United States federal government should enact substantial criminal justice reform in the United States in sentencing by eliminating mandatory minimums and applying these changes retroactively. Contention two is the advantage. On this contention, we will demonstrate that mandatory minimum sentences have contributed to mass incarceration in two ways. First is prosecutorial discretion. Currently, Prosecutors have discretion over whether a person receives a mandatory minimum charge. Because of their racially biased, people of color receive disproportionately high sentences, Rahavi and Star 14. An important mechanism appears to give rise to the majority of disparity in sentences, how prosecutors choose to handle the case. In particular, the decision to bring charges carrying mandatory minimum sentences. Black men have 1.75 times the odds of facing such charges. Mandatory minimum charging is capable of explaining more than half of the black-white sentence disparities. Prosecutors enjoy broad discretion to choose charges and negotiate plea agreements. Charges carrying mandatory minimums translate powerfully into sentence disparities. Our proposal would replace mandatory minimums with a more flexible system of sentencing guidelines. These guidelines would allow judges to consider the context of a case and give lower sentences. Families against mandatory minimums note eight. There are two types of sentencing law, mandatory minimums and sentencing guidelines. The most common mandatory sentences are for five and 10 years and are based on the weight of the drug or the presence of a firearm. These laws prevent judges from considering relevant factors such as the defendant's role in the offense or the likelihood of committing a future offense. Sentencing guidelines require the judge to consider facts about the crime and defendant. Consideration of these facts leads to, considering these facts leads to a guideline range. Judges have discretion to choose a sentence below the range. The guidelines are clearly preferable. Judges believe that mandatory minimums are too harsh. They would give lower sentences in a system of sentencing guidelines, nearly 20. Federal judges oppose mandatory minimums because of heavy-handed punishment and lack of judicial discretion. Judge Bennett encapsulates federal judges' opinions in the following statement. Mandatory minimums are incredibly harsh and snare nonviolent low level addicts. They're faced with 20 year and sometimes life mandatory minimum sentences. That's a travesty. Mandatory minimums were passed without a single congressional hearing, and not a single federal judge was called to testify. They picked mandatory minimums and drug quantities out of thin air. Mandatory minimums create imbalance in the justice system. Restoring discretionary power to judges will aid in stabilizing the courtroom by alleviating prosecutorial power. Eliminating mandatory minimums would shift power from prosecutors to judges. This has historically reduced racial disparities in sentencing. Fishman 12. Judicial discretion can reduce racial disparities in sentencing. Racial disparities are smaller during periods of differential review. Judicial discretion does not contribute to and may in fact mitigate racial disparities in sentencing. Policymakers interested in redressing racial disparity should pay closer attention to mandatory minimums and their effects on judicial discretion. Second is plea bargaining. Prosecutors use mandatory minimums as a threat during plea bargaining. This allows them to coerce defendants into guilty pleas. Human Rights Watch 13. Mandatory sentencing laws curtail the judiciary's function of ensuring the punishment fits the crime. When prosecutors pursue charges and the defendant is convicted, judges must impose the sentences. Prosecutors, in effect, sentence convicted defendants by the charges they bring. Mandatory minimums are key to the weight of the drug, regardless of the defendant's role or culpability. Someone hired to drive a box of drugs across town goes to the same minimum sentence as a major trafficker. Prosecutors threaten to increase defendant sentences if they refuse to plead. Prior convictions dramatically increase sentence and charges increase sentence if a gun was involved. Prosecutors threaten to pursue these additional penalties unless the defendant pleads guilty and make good on those threats. Eliminating mandatory minimums would reduce prosecutorial power, preventing excessive plea deals, nearly 20. Abolition of mandatory minimums will rein in prosecutorial power and deter excessive pleas. Mandatory minimum sentencing guides excessive pleas. When mandatory minimum sentencing first began, 20% of cases resolved by trial. Now, less than 3% of federal criminal cases resolved by trial. Prosecutors impose mandatory minimums to coerce them to plead guilty. Prosecutors devastate low income communities already suffering from discriminatory law enforcement. Restoring judicial discretion will rein in prosecutorial overreach. 
The impact is the destruction of communities and inhumane prison conditions. Mandatory bit minimums separate families, harm economic opportunities upon release, and cause cyclical incarceration. Snyder 15. There are 2 million people in prison, many incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses. Mandatory minimums fail to calculate the tremendous socioeconomic costs associated with incarcerating low income African American men and women for nonviolent drug offenses. Mandatory minimum sentences break families apart for long periods, leaving a ripple effect on the community left behind. The most severely affected are children and their mothers. That mother needs to raise her children on her own while being the sole financial provider. Children will be more susceptible to the criminal justice system. Mandatory minimums have harmful effects on an individual once released. Drug offenses result in a record that harms economic and familiar prosperity. Men with records are estimated to earn 40% less, experience more unemployment, and have unstable family lives. Mandatory minimums increase the chances that families will be torn apart and subject vulnerable children to cyclical incarceration. Longer prison sentences are associated with greater violence in prison and mental health consequences upon release. Haney 12. Prisons expose prisoners to severe degradation and danger. The extreme stress that results appears to have adverse consequences on prisoners' physical and mental health. Prison stress endured for long periods of time may persist long after prisoners have been released. The severity of environmental stress played a significant role in anxiety and depression. PTSD among prisoners may occur 10 times more often than in the general population, and suicide occurs at a much higher rate, the product of harsh prison conditions during confinement. Imprisonment may produce lasting problems that persist long after prisoners are released. Serious psychological problems manifest after they re-enter free society. Former inmates suffer mortality rates that were three and a half times that of the general population. Immediate action is necessary. Federal prisons are uniquely vulnerable to COVID-19. Burkhalter, 412. Prisons have been dangerous during the pandemic. More than 1,400 infections and seven deaths have been reported each day. Cramped, unsanitary settings have been ideal for incubating disease. More than 2,700 inmates have died. In federal facilities, at least 39% have been infected. Access to quality healthcare is poor. More than 138,000 correctional officers were sickened. Allergies are still steep and infections continue to climb. More contagious variants have appeared and once that new strain gets here, it's going to spread like wildfire. Contention three is framing. On this contention, we will explain how you should evaluate the round. As a logical policymaker, you should prioritize preventing the probable harm of ongoing prison violence, Kester 8. Risk defined by potential loss leads to the marginalization of probabilities. The highest degree of improbability becomes irrelevant as loss goes to infinity. Risk management as rational breaks down, and security policy represents a logic of catastrophe. Even the most absurd scenarios gain plausibility by constructing a chain of potentialities, improbable events are brought into the probable. Reducing structural violence reduces existential risks by curbing negative ripple effects, Casper X 17. Ruining the lives of actual persons for humanity bears a close resemblance to a pungent conclusion. We could instead reduce existential risks by indirect means, by curbing negative ripple effects. Ripple effects affect the far future, reaching wider as time passes. A network of ripple effects might make technological or cultural innovations arrive more quickly. Ongoing violence outweighs unlikely future threats. Reject the security trick, Jackson 12. Big threats distract you from structural violence. The facts are irrefutable. The state spends on security measures that have no impact on risk and engages in security theater. Gender security is one confident trick to distract you from inequalities which are the real threat. If you think terrorists or Iran are a greater threat, you're much more likely to die from structural violence. Thank you for listening and open for cross-examination. Okay, you good for cross checks? Yep. Let's start in your sort of plea bargaining scenario. The plea bargains still exist for a wide variety of reasons through a lot of other sentencing uh, a lot of other like sentencing and laws. How does he have to solve for all plea bargaining? Uh, uh, sure. So our, we have two pieces of evidence to turn to. First, the Human Rights Watch evidence explains that the existence of mandatory minimums is utilized by prosecutors to coerce people into guilty pleas. The Neely evidence goes on to explain that this effect has resulted in a causal effect. That is, mandatory minimums cause the trial rate to go from 20% to 3%. Yeah, I understand that. But nowhere does it make a reverse causal claim that if we ended mandatory minimums, all plea bargains will end. I don't understand how you can solve this when it's just descriptive of the status quo and doesn't have a sort of well, solvency method for the affirmative. That's a good question. There are two responses. First, we're not saying we should have no plea bargains. Rather, people shouldn't be coerced into them. Second, the daily evidence does establish reverse causality because at the bottom of it, it explains that it could rein in prosecutorial overreach and quote, rein in prosecutorial overreach and restore judicial discretion, which would be the act of banning mandatory minimums. Okay, uh, yeah, I understand that. The, what is it? Actually, how does YAF let people out of prison? So like post staff, does everyone who is sentenced on a mandatory minimum get released? How does that process work? The plan would resentence all those who have been affected by existing mandatory minimum statutes, which would lower their sentences. It would resentence. What does enforce them from taking plea bargains again? 
Weak sentencing isn't a new trial. That is, there is no opportunity to take a plea. Rather, it's judges look at cases and look at individual sentences and lowering the, lowering the length of the trial. Our daily evidence, the first piece, explains that judges understand mandatory minimums to be too harsh and that they want to make lower sentences. So sure. in the world of weak sentencing, they would be lower. So like judges empirically, uh, increased sentences have done a lot of messed up things, uh, and including, I believe, your nearly evidence. Actually, never mind. That's not the nearly evidence. But police or the how can we trust judges when judges have ruled in increased sentences for people of color? Your own evidence when your own evidence is about sort of like the incarceration of people of color. Judges. Uh First, I'd argue that that's a mischaracterization of our evidence. Our Fishman evidence is fantastic because it's an empirical study that concludes that when we take power from prosecutors and give it to judges, racial disparities have empirically gone down. Second, our nearly evidence explains that judges want sentences to be lower right now, but they can't do anything about it. If judges wanted to be racist, they can still do that in the world of the status quo because mandatory minimums provide a floor for length, but not a ceiling. So they can still go as high as they want, but our plan gives judges the opportunity to go lower, which our evidence says they would do. Okay. Um, on Tuesday, there's a Supreme Court decision that, uh, on Tuesday, there's a Supreme Court decision. It was the, sorry, I don't know the exact Supreme Court decision. It isolated that an offender is eligible for a sentence reduction under the First Step Act. I don't understand how the AF doesn't, is like inherent considering well, that Supreme Court decision. Well, the sentence was actually, the decision was actually the opposite of that. But regardless, it was a question of interpreting the First Step Act, which had nowhere near the scope of the affirmative, which would affect every mandatory minimum. I just sent the one in C. Let me know when everyone has received it, but the order is three off, the framing contention, and then the advantage. Uh, cases in the order of framing and then the advantage. Okay, can I get some sort of confirmation that everyone has it and is good to go? Okay, I'll start in like five seconds absent any objections. First off is the Neil Libke. Fiscally oriented reformism of mandatory minimums repackages the carceral net into more insidious forms of social control that maintain the cybernetic carceral state. From story 19, fiscal burden of US prison system is proven to be a lightning rod for penal reform efforts. The DOJ announced sentencing reform, including scaling back mandatory minimums. These changes are quite narrow in scope. Freedom for redeemable prisoners has been purchased through hardening of punishment regimes against many others. The privilege according to relatively innocent without many reform initiatives. The DOJ channel financial disconnect into a neoliberal approach to penal reform, focusing on the three R's of reform, reentry, justice, reinvestment, and recidivism, widening the carceral net through th through electronic monitoring and post-custodial forms of social control. Despite legislative changes, other carceral institutions continue to appear. It remains to be seen whether main mainstream critique leads to anything other. And cybernetic capitalism's constant search for the technological utopia will produce extinction from Featherstone or 20. The point of equilibrium continues to be thwarted the technological utopia, meaning the innovation never ends. Humanity is endlessly into fall. We make machines that make problems. The human no longer feels at home. Modern tech suspends the history of co-production, which saw humanity and machine we come together in favor of a new state where machines develop and humans lose all sense of where things came from. Under these new conditions, the machine encourages people to look upon people and animals to be abused in the name of development. We are now on the road to extinction. And thus, the alternative is panic. Panic creates fear for the cybernetations. Only our method can create new civilizations free from the system by creating a new form of familiarity. Our quest then becomes disintegration, where fear becomes as extravagant as hope. This form of political nihilism creates a mode of resistance that can't be handled by the machine. Noise is the line of flight. The imaginary party, which proliferates from beneath the empire through the amplification of our, of our noise creates an entirely new system of home above, from Tikkun Hatem. Defeating cybernization through panic. Panic means the cybernetization's panic. It represents risk. Panic is dangerous. Mastery of this kind is the event lived of all herd animals who save themselves together. Panic reveals the war is a disintegration. Communities break off from the social and escape it, but since they are still physically captive, they attack it. The quest after panic is a technique for assuming risk of disintegration. The end of hope in the utopia is forming like a bridge, a relationship from the, between the movement of cybernetic capitalism. In nihilism, fear must become as extravagant as hope. Any is called noise, which cannot be handled by the machine. Noise is the lines of light. The non-in-world, what we call the imaginary party, 
is our heterogeneous ensemble of noise, which proliferate beneath the empire without the reversing of equilibrium. Next up is the drug trafficking pick. The United States federal government should reduce mandatory minimum penalties, reserving them exclusively for high-level drug offenders. The counter plan makes mandatory minimums more effective at preventing high-level drug offenses from Sterling and Five. Congress should replace bad mandatory minimum drug sentences for major level drug dealers to encourage proper priorities. The Justice Department's small potatoes cases saying it builds cases against high level offenders from the bottom up has not been effective in stopping drugs. Congress and the Justice Department should make effective drug enforcement the priority. Congress needs to send the message, it's time to get effective. Old mandatory minimums don't work and to be repealed. And drug trafficking causes international conflict and domestic instability. Freeze and dwarf and seven. Drugs are a prime topic of IR insecurity. Smuggling can trigger military intervention. Seen in Panama, drugs can fuel violent domestic conflict. The industry can undermine democratic instability. Traffickers undermine state legitimacy. The drug economy is a burden on the criminal justice and health systems. Drug industry destroys the environment. Processing requires chemical products who pollute soil and water. Forests important for the ecosystem have been cleared by coca and poppy fields. Next off is the riots desire. Federal courts are slowly reopening to focus on the DC riots, Thompson and 3-5. DC's federal courts to resume jury trials, a move that comes as hundreds of criminal prosecutions landed the court over January 6 riots. We need to become the only one trial at a time due to the need to limit number of people. As the pandemic begins to ease, we will increase capacity. A federal prosecutor noted the large volume of discovery and capital prosecutions. And the plan will cause substantial legal change. Local agencies would fight the plan in federal court. Weichelbaum in 17, in 15, sorry. As the Obama administration ratcheted up its oversight of state and local law enforcement, questions about the effectiveness of interventions have been on the rise. Local officials refuse to accept what they view as meddlesome, me meddlesome dict dictates, preferring to fight the demands for change in federal court. And failure to successfully prosecute sends a global signal of the collapse of justice and democracy. Brockler and 1A. What took place on January 6th was a reprehensible affront to democracy. It was criminal. The message must be at the best equipped country on the planet for the peaceful transfer of power has zero tolerance. And democratic leadership is key to solve existential risks like terrorism. Kasparov in 17. A nation found enough freedom was bound to defend freedom everywhere. Existential threat is very real. Terrorist movements, extremist parties, a paranoid tyrant in North Korea and threatening nuclear blackmail. An aggressive KGB dictator want to turn the world back to a dark past because their survival is threatened by violence of the free world, epitomized by the U.S. They are thriving as the U.S. is retreated. American leadership begins at, at home. Stability is the great strength of democracies. Strong institutions that outlast politicians allow for long-range planning. Democracy is the only proven remedy for every crisis that plagues the world. On to framing. First, existential risks outweigh from Orton 20. Extinction would eliminate all possibilities forever, reducing humanity to a pre act state. Futures would collapse to meager options, a failed world with no way back. Leave the thresholds vague, unprecedented until too late. These required evidential probability, which describes belief on available info. Credence will occur in light of our best evidence. Billions are on the line. Responding would be the world's top priority. And dissides are systematically underestimated. Weiner in 16. That rare risks outweigh depend on probability and consequence. Response will depend on policy. Psych indicates experts are neglected. Ultra risks are not experienced. It is experts applying quant methods while the public seems less interested. Mega risks are not salient, not experienced, so availability is lacking. Describing risks in speech is less effective in simulated reaction. People may envision humans going extinct. That may not translate into concern about specific risk warranting responses. The prefrontal cortex, when envisioned scenarios, draw on experience. The brain relies on available events, even for its analytic about scenarios. Unavailability and neglect may compound disdain for warnings. The person is viewed as insane. Second is magnitude. Psych large. Psych yields large impact yields numbing. As lives rise, respondents feel overwhelmed. The end of the world may be too much, disabling rather than mobilizing. People deflect problems so large they may consume all capacity. The public may be eager to save the refugee, but less willing to save a large unidentified population. Asterisks like a single individual. And their arguments don't assume debate where dropped arguments are true. Prefer the specificity of our scenarios. We also access their framing through turns case and the counter plan, which proves we have intentions of resolving structural violence. I'll go to the advantage now. First, the status quo solves. Biden ends plans on ending mandatory minimums and fund sta funding state reform from Lopez in 19. Biden's $20 billion grant program would encourage states to eliminate mandatory minimums, the biggest chance at a broad impact on incarceration. And the AF can't solve for state sentences, which is what 95% of offenders are. There are tons of all causes to the sentencing disparities of the affirmative. Things like three strikes laws as per their first piece of evidence, truth in sentencing and drug laws all proved from colon and 18. Three strikes laws are a way legislators remove sentencing discretion. A person is beyond rehab after three crimes. Penalty is much more severe. People spend their lives in prison for petty crimes. Truth in sentencing laws eliminate opportunities for early release requiring 75% of prison term behind bars. Different sentences for different drugs. Possession of crack common in communities of color is punished much more severely, even after the Fair Sentencing Act. And judged by his thumps, the affirmative gives them total discretion of sentences. Conservative court packing means that they'll uphold high sentences now, which at best means that the F has zero effect. And the AF doesn't solve for plea bargains. Other drug laws prevent them from being eradicated. And coercive plea bargaining makes racially biased lengthy sentences inevitable. Yafi in 17. 
Most adjudicated waive the right to a trial and protections that go along. The vast majority of felony convictions are plea bargains, 97% at the federal level. Horse trading between prosecutor and defense determine who goes to jail. Plea bargains make it easier to convict defendants not guilty, intrinsically tied up with race. Prosecutors threaten the trial in penalty, lack the resources, compelled to take whatever deal the prosecutor offers, even if innocent. Thanks to plea bargains, millions of Americans have a criminal record. Having a record means tougher charges and punishments, so coercive many SM people feel they have no option. Next, they have a COVID impact at the bottom of the 1AC, but there is no impact. Their evidence is about jails and detention centers, which the AFT doesn't affect because they're pre-trial, whereas mandatory minimums are used post-sentence. It's also about the past year, doesn't assume declining rates of infection or vaccine programs for prisoners. And the court just did the affirmative, so you can vote negative on presumption from Wellen and 614. And Terry, the court held a defender is eligible for a sentence reduction under the First Step Act if convicted of offense that triggered a mandatory minimum sentence. Sotomayor agreed with Thomas's interpretation. I have five seconds left. We will send that card out before cross-examination. Sounds good. It's been sent. All right, ready to begin? Yep. Cool. Let's talk about the critique first. The alternative, what does it mean to be beneath the empire? Uh, sure. So the sort of argument about beneath the empire is sort of the argument that the alternative is sort of an invisible party. So the state does not recognize who is or is not part of the alternative. Okay. So in the world of the invisible party, would it result in any state action or is it independent and divorced from state action? No, it's independence, divorced from state okay. action. Okay. Divorced from state action, what does it do to resolve the effects of like the actual federal government or like these sorts of actions being done that reserve capitalism? Uh, sure. So we think that part of the taken evidence describes sort of the increase in noise. So that can include things like hacking specific systems that the federal government uses for things like military weapons or capitalism. It also includes sort of just like a break from things like capitalism attacking the sort of places that it thrives. Okay, uh, I suppose in terms of the disadvantage of hacking, in terms of other methods that would be endorsed by alternative, is it just like disruption of the federal government action, like hack, with things like hacking? I'm not sure I understand the question. The alternative includes hacking, but is not limited to hacking. Okay, but what else would it, would it be included in terms of resisting the federal government? Uh, sure, so one thing we think is that we don't need to win the physical implementation of the alternative is good if we win one of two claims. First is ontology, second is a sort of pedagogy or all, the okay, like, education. About that. What ontological claims is the affirmative making? Uh, the the affirmative, affirmative is not. Oh, yeah. So yeah. we think that the Tikkun evidence and the Featherstone evidence sort of make an ontology claim about, about the way that technology sort of creates things like techno positivism. So we become entranced by sort of the idea that we have to be saved by technology to sort of like necessitate increases in technological development. Okay, to be clear, these arguments about the way capitalism operates at large, that makes sense. And I suppose the second part you talked about pedagogy, what claims are they making on this regard? Uh, sure, we think that it's sort of an argument about the way that the affirmative or that the alternative is sort of a rejection of investments within the state or the idea of token concessions by the state government as being sort of making it redeemable or any sort of those okay. arguments or sort of a uh, rejection okay. of things like cybernetic capitalism. Okay, uh, I want to talk about the disadvantage for a second. The link evidence is about Obama ratcheting up enforcement over state enforcement. The plan does not have anything to do with any state system. So why would local agencies fight it in court? Uh, sure. So we think that the evidence is not solely about things like state evidence or like state action. We think that the Justice Department's decision under the Obama administration also created federal changes mm -hmm. and that the local yeah. officials were allowed to go to federal court to challenge those things. Well, I suppose that makes sense. But the tag is, quote, local agencies fight the plan. And the, tar the text of the article talks about how it's, quote, ratcheted up oversight of state and local law enforcement. It talks about how that caused them to backlash. Why would state and local law enforcement backlash the plan if it has nothing to do with them whatsoever? We will read specific evidence in the block about how sort of federal policies of the way that mandatory minimums function specifically angers people to where they'd use incremental changes within litigation strategies. Okay. Okay. So they think that they can sort of change federal law because they want more money from the federal government for being harsh okay. on crime. Uh, counterpoint, what evidence do you have that makes the causal claim that existence or more mandatory minimums would deter cartels? Uh, sure. We think that that's sort of the Sterling evidence and the Freeze endorse evidence. They both sort of describe how a sort of increase in attention on sort of the way that uh, high-level drug offenders function in mandatory minimums can prevent it. So the, free, the Sterling evidence describes yeah. how sort of if we do the affirmative in all instances except that, that sort, that sort of sends a signal, which is okay. a good result. Sounds good. Thank you. I'm sending out the 2AC document right now. It's been sent. Let me know when everyone receives that.
Um, in the meantime, the order is going to be the advantage, framing, the critique, the high level offenders pick, and then the disadvantage of the courts. Uh, could I get some type of confirmation from everyone when they're ready? Perfect. Mandatory minimums expose prisoners to traumatizing and dehumanizing conditions, tear apart families and communities, and magnify racial disparities throughout the criminal justice system. Prosecutors disproportionately charge people of color with mandatory minimum charges and weaponize them during plea bargaining to coerce defendants into guilty pleas. One and see one, the status quo doesn't solve. Even if Biden made a campaign promise, it's nowhere near the top of his agenda and pushback in Congress means it won't go through. One and see two, solving for states is irrelevant when we've highlighted federal mandatory minimums as our impact. They're 10 to 20 times longer and overlapping jurisdiction means state sentences are taken over at the federal level. One and see three, no alternative causes. This evidence is about the state level, and many of them are mandatory minimums in the first place, which would be removed. The Barco evidence quantifies that mandatory minimums are over half of federal incarceration, which means we can solve. One in C4, no judge bias. This is an assertion without evidence to back it up. The Neely evidence cites federal judges themselves and says they want to give lower sentences, and the Fishman evidence is comparative and says that when we take power away from prosecutors and give it to judges, racial disparities are mitigated. One in C5 and six. We do solve for plea bargaining. We're not saying plea bargaining should be eliminated altogether, but that mandatory minimums should not be weaponized during this process. The Neely evidence is causal in saying that mandatory minimums reduce the overall trial rate from 20% to 3%, which the affirmative is able to reduce. One in C7, yes, COVID impact. The Burkhalter evidence says that federal prisons are uniquely vulnerable because people are slower to get the vaccine and the closer conditions mean it spreads faster. One in C8, no presumption. This evidence gives no statistics, and the First Step Act applies to a narrow subset of, of offenders, which means that it's not sufficient to solve for the 100,000 people in prison. Framing. Evaluate probability and magnitude equally rather than inflating infinite magnitude. Prefer it. First is logic. Anything else collapses in on itself because any risk times infinity still has an infinite expected value. That's Kessler. That means if we sufficiently disprove the dissent's probability, magnitude should become irrelevant. Second is future generations. Reducing structural violence in the short term curves negative ripple effects to reduce existential risk in the long term. That's Kazmarek. That means we access their, their any risk framing. One in C1, we don't reject UTIL, we just said that they have to access a high probability first. One in C2, dissents aren't underestimated in the context of debate where people create contrived link chains, but you shouldn't overcorrect for bias because there's no way to know when you've done it enough. One in C3 and four, we will debate. So these arguments are not relevant. The K. One, the role of the ballot is to evaluate the desirability of a topical plan against a competitive alternative or the status quo. Debating the should and the resolution is the only predictable point of stasis, which is key to fairness outweighs because it's the only impact the ballot can solve. Two, perm do both. We can both recognize that mandatory minimums cause undue violence through the carceral system and criticize capitalism. That doesn't preclude more radical intervention into the criminal justice system, but says that it's important to alleviate material violence in the prison system in the status quo. That outweighs. Prisons are a unique form of daily torture, especially during COVID, that you should immediately address. That's the Haney and Burkhalter evidence. Third, perm do that and all non mutually exclusive parts vault, have the USFG do the F and the agent of thought do its action. Fourth, there's no link. The F isn't fiscally oriented. We forefronted racial disparities as justification for the F. Their evidence discusses changes that are narrow in scope, but the F isn't that because we reduced the federal prison population by half. Fifth, their critique is ahistorical and utopian reforms are effective, Lancaster 17. Abolitionists and we must choose between abolition of forms, arguments, and working the understanding of history of reforms in 97, where we have a history of counter reform and logic of universities, labor, so prison imposes unfreedom for a set period of time, both the public police, prison, religion, we need to fight for measure of improvement, effect, consider families, as much like US after reforms. The country is one tenth the rate of incarceration, but abolition, we should fight and introduce this condition, broad vision, set it low to track support from the number of its greatest strong institutions, become also doing more effective alternative to the public police, no such word is associated with the right of the prison, the thing of the past. Six, cap is sustainable, West Regard 18. Reports contain basic and little more say standard by ideology, pessimists, and nor possibility of new technology. Offered sign by the life science education and health in the 80s for cyback was discussed, but never how about other puzzles that disappeared over our DDOs and metals, soot, waste, and acid. Society handled situations quite well. Fish stocks recovered emissions, reduced forests, are expanding waste, being recited, phosphorus, sorority solutions, heck, it's from polluted water, but enough energy when I store technology, suit emissions, have an increased innovation of accelerating people, which will hold growth, forget what time would cry more electricity than the old medicine, malnutrition, if it were telling the world, sulfur, and aggregates, and hydro, at any given point, critics saying we reach optimal development, we had it not then, and not now. Next, the alternative fails if it's not material. White elites recognize and profit from the suffering caused by the carceral 
system critique, or panic fails because these elites have superior economic and military resources and an incentive to preserve the status quo. And even if they do eventually collapse a system that's too slow, which means people suffer and die in prison in the meantime, conditionality is a voting issue, causes strategy skew because advocating multiple worlds makes generating two AC offense impossible and irresponsible orientation because they can kick out of whatever winning dispo solves their offense. The pick. One, perm do both. Two, perm do the counter plan. Third, the counter, the solvency affidavit flows aff. It says that low level mandatory minimums are bad because they distract from prosecuting high level threats. Elimination altogether allows for that redirection of resources. Fourth, mandatory minimums don't decrease crime or help with deterrence or public safety. Line 15. Mandatory minimums have no effect on deterrence or citizens and public safety. Deterrence is a function of certainty simply increasing severity does not deter crime. Mandatory minimums have no effect on certain mandatory and efficient cost result. Mandatory minimum sensing increase or recidivism meta analysis of 117 centers found a longer prison centers were associated with the increase in recidivism. Mandatory minimums not produce an increase in public safety. Fifth, there's no definition of what consists of a high level drug crime, which means that there's circumvention by prosecutors and Congress. Sixth, is that sentencing guidelines solve. We don't end all prosecution of people, just say that they should do it through sentencing guidelines. If they're actually a major trafficker, they'd still receive a high sentence. Seventh, there's no solvency. No and says that mandatory minimums are actually capable of solving for drug trafficking. Eighth, picks are bad. They steal the offer, infinitely regressive, and make it impossible to garner offense, reject the team. The court clogged us said. One, non-unique cases are already up from last year, older 819. Federal courts are 30% more petty cases compared to last year despite comes after coronavirus first course, the whole proceeding and transition to social distancing. Second, people won't fight the plan. The link evidence is not specific, and there's no reason why states would fight federal policy that only affects the federal system. Third, there's no internal link. The federal government can prioritize their prosecution of capital rise over fights about the plan. Fourth, structural trends overwhelm democracy, politicization, media disinformation, polarization, and authoritarianism. Diamond 20. Democracy will not recover. Scholar track decline rooted in polarization. Trump damaged northern institutions, disrupted assaults and media efforts to politicize misuse of presidential power. Trump so distressed in the electoral process. Biden will not hear democracy. Republicans will remain under populism. Sides of political decay from liberal polarization, distrust, and tolerance led to democratic breakdowns and authoritarian populism made worse by the rise of China and Russian retreat of the United States. Uh, can like a lot more cards be added to the doc? Okay, back to the critique, the alternative. Hacking the government is bad. Empowering cyber defense stops an impending surge of attacks targeting critical infrastructure, including the grid, nuclear power, and dams, you're at all 18. Matter of time before another militia actor aims at bigger targets, separate critical infrastructure sector in the US from nuclear power to water facilities, unless some form of computer enable system for operation that attack could have devastating capacity to designate cybersecurity and bigger starts to the entire financial system, malicious cyber and some coordinated resources and other prioritize high level intrusions sent from global organized crime state sponsored attack nurse nation states and terrorists use the as an operation tool and clean malicious cyber attacks domestic belief system rewards are high and risk low targets, fan or wide spectrum security implication by CS grid and dubs can threaten large scale discretion beyond financial crime doing well damage US national security adversaries seeking this still National security as we have an enforcement crisis, low enforcement consequences, cyber criminals operating with near impunity, unlikely chance of being caught. Law enforcement deal with what is possible when enforcement target individual actors, for example, espionage attacks on the intellectual property arrested individuals. Government was able to indict Russian jury, bring diamonds against the individual. Many argue enforcement action cannot find a private enforcement action can have a substantial refinement of diamonds of prosecution or court action. Symmetry, the ability of the law enforcement to attribute to have made it to others and diamonds given its identity concerns are often hanged seriously under country impact relations. And blackouts from grid hacking cause extinction, raise 18. Well, depends on networks, power grids, air traffic control, finance, and less networks are really not weighed by catastrophic rate on grid level. Electricity cities when the end have a slow deficit and survivors cannot regenerate and triggers retaliation, CLAR 19. Path of escalation, cascading serious cyber treason, and catastrophic and national differences on major power developed cyber attacks and attacks could lead to an escalating attacks, risking the slippery slope and global conflict. Cyber attacking this power grid could trigger these attacks on the energy and financial system, leading to the war. All right, could you send out those three cards? It was a doubt. Okay. I'm ready for cross X, so. Okay. Are you good? Yeah. Let's start on the pick. What does permutation do both look like? Uh, it is just a test of competition. Okay. Uh, Eliminating does... mandatory minimums and reinstating the ones for high level drug offenders, I would suppose. Okay. Uh, what does the affirmative do for the prison population? The affirmative only affects the length of sentences, correct? I, I'm a little bit confused about your question. Our affirmative is applied retroactively, which means people who are currently incarcerated would have their sentences reduced to the point where many would be let out. Okay, so, okay. I so guess that, that makes sense. impacts the prison population. You've said that the entirety of the 1AC is solely about federal prison sentences. What piece of evidence in the 1AC do you think ever says federal? The Barkow evidence talks about how mandatory minimums are responsible for half of the federal prison population and says that that's about 100,000 people. Federal mandatory minimums are also more significant because they're significantly longer and they take a prosecution from the states. Wait, where does it mention federal? The Barkow evidence oh, is talking okay. about the federal I guess it does say. and federal mandatory minimums. Okay. You haven't yeah. read so, any evidence on the state's claim, so. Sure, okay. Really well, I, 
don't think that's true. So I, I get that you have read it a piece of evidence that, evidence that describes this sort of inherency question as half of the people in federal prisons now are based on sentences that could have had mandatory minimum sentences. Not could have Where had. The could rest have. of the like impact cards in the 1AC are about things like state facilities though. Okay, we've isolated these as a specific problem. Federal mandatory minimums are worse than state ones because they are significantly longer, 10 or 20 times so. Our impact evidence describes why prolonged incarceration is bad because the longer a person spends in prison, the more isolated they become from their families and communities and the more violence they suffer through. So addressing the federal system is the priority. How much do you think sentences will be reduced by on average? I can't give you that number because if you look at the federal sentencing guidelines, they're like 600 pages long. So the Neely evidence says that most judges think mandatory minimums are far too high and would like to give significantly lower sentences if they had the ability to do so. But That's because right. it's a case by case basis, there's no specific average. You extend this sort of COVID argument about vaccines and coronavirus cases. The Burkhalter evidence in the 1EC is about things like jails and detention facilities. And it's no, describing it's the sort of deaths and infections of the past year. Why so does it make- not claiming to solve for all COVID and all detention centers. No, we're saying I, that this is a problem in federal prisons that we can counteract by reducing prison where, populations. Where does it mention federal prisons? It's about jails I, and I detention don't have centers. Card open, but it yeah. talks about how the nature of prisons makes it so that COVID spreads more easily. And it also says that prisoners and guards are less likely to receive vaccines, which means they're also more, more vulnerable to the disease. Okay, the disadvantage, the alter evidence, uh, that's, that's fine, sorry. Eight minutes. Six oh four. I'm sending the cards out right now. Actually, I'll type prep in chat first. It sent. Um. I'm going to set up the stands, but while that happens, the order is the critique, the pick, the advantage.
Okay. Did everyone get the cards? Great. Without a verbal objection, I will go in like five seconds. The critique will concede a permutation and that there's not a link to the affirmative. Their only offense is against the alternative, but kicking it solves because we're not going for the alt as an advocacy anymore. And we'll concede that the alternative doesn't solve. So it does not matter. They said condo, will concede, they said condo, all the offer dispo, you didn't ask in cross-examination, which means that all the offer dispo, you read a firm on both, doesn't matter. There's not a reason to reject the team. You said condo, you said dispo solves, the pick. The counterplan solves the app. It ends all mandatory minimum penalties, except for high level drug crimes. Their only internal link is about low level offenses for small drug crimes, like one gram of marijuana, but ours is about hyper specific to about 50 grams uh, or 50 kilos of uh, cocaine. So that solves drug trafficking. It stops criminalization of small drug dealers, which fixes and allows for high level drug trafficking. It fixes previous mandatory minimums and allows criminalization for high level crimes. It's one in C Sterling. Drug trafficking causes war, military intervention, domestic conflict, destroys democracy. That goes nuclear. That's one in C Freedom Source. That outweighs the app. First is magnitude. Nuclear war causes extinction. Internally outweighs the affirmative. Second, first probability. War is quick and regional hotspots exists now. It isolates Panama, which all will go nuclear short in a short term. So, uh, third is time frame. The war is, is insane. It escalates fast. Drug traffickers is the prime concern of iron security at the moment. They have not answered the they have not answered the internal net benefit of the pick, which means a 1% chance that we saw a sufficient amount of the affirmative. This means you vote negative. It, it means that you vote negative, especially when they had one solvency deficit that wasn't even flushed out. But that impact turns the case. They, they were in the world of war. The drug trafficking is from, uh, in a world of war. Drug trafficking, it causes people of color to be overcome by police as a response because they do the mess drug traffickers. That also turns to uh, another turns case. Extinction hurts POC the most, it, and the government will, know, will only protect the white away. And drug trafficking that destroys the environment. That's when I see freedoms where it causes pollution, causing natural ecosystems and extinction. That's Roberts. Uh, it's Rogers in 15. A major global extinction is, is under is underway. We're certainly in the mass extinction. The, the problem is now we're losing so many species. The resiliency of the ecosystem class is not too late for humans to do their rights or the wrongs. We can stop mass extinction in a strike. It's only doing nothing on the pearl. There's been mass extinction before. We were wiping out 90% of life on Earth. And what's at stake here is the weather community will be able to survive. If they want a permutation or solvency, they'll say, Judge Kick the counterplan and vote on the net benefit as a case. And it's reasonably right that mandatory minimums can be good. Judge Kick checks abuse of two errors. So they said permutation to both, but it fails. Links in that benefit. First, it separates out of the app. The counterplan allows for mandatory minimums in some instances. Second, hold them to their plaintext, they, their plaintext. The plaintext prevents any mandatory minimums. The counterplan is distinct. Second, a third, it links the net benefit. The firm prevents mandatory minimums in all instances, which causes warming and drug trafficking, which would cause warming and uh, warming in regional hotspots. So it doesn't matter. They said permutation to the counterplan. It's severance. It steals all of our offense. It makes it impossible to be negative. That's a voter for fairness. If we win any of our offense on the theory debate, then it's a reason on why you can't vote negative on the permutation. They said the counterplan doesn't solve the app. The counterplan doesn't solve the app, but it does. The counterplan solves all of the mass incarceration, internal links. Minority and people of incarcerated are, are major traffickers. That's Zachary and 14. Federal sentencing have not been particularly successful. A large portion of incarceration of incarcerated drug offenders are global offenders rather than my major traffickers. And it's functioning to Obama policy that was reversed by Trump, which means it's all that's after in 18, under Obama, prosecutors were unable to were able to use discretion to make an individual assessment. The default is not to seek minimum mandatory minimum sentence unless certain circumstances were present. Such a person used violence, were connected to international drug cartel, a weapon, and the, the course of the crime, and had more than three criminal history points. That takes so older how we don't solve how we don't solve major criminals because they have no evidence of why that. Then they kind of plan to restructure and freeze up more resources for targeting dangerous drug offenders. That's what Zachary. And 14, prison, and the prison should be reserved for those most deserving of punishment. Those are always fit to be the community. Important for instancing policy, the federal resources should not be used where necessary. Subjecting low level drug offenders for long sentences not serve the uh, purpose. Prison population should identify those who are threatened, removing the, the least culpable offenders, would free up funding for more use of effective use. So the serious of the, drug, uh, the, the dangerous drug offenders should be the focus of law enforcement prosecutors. Sentencing guidelines need restructuring. They made it. They made a turn. So the land evidence that they read does not say anything. It's about recidivism. It says about low-level drug offenders, and says that those don't solve. And, that, and it says that mandatory minimums don't solve low-level drug offenders and low-level drug trafficking and people selling weed on the street. But that's not what the internal link on there. That's not what the internal net benefit on the pick is about. It doesn't answer anything because the net internal net benefit is about people like 50 kilos of marijuana. But but the counterpoint makes deterrence more effective for high-level drug sentencing. That's. Well, how's it attend? The concern for public safety and reform of offenders proceed from understanding that punishment is inherently just. Indignation is an appropriate response to an inherently wrongful conduct carried out. The util utilitarian goal of lowering the crimes of deterrence and incapable worthwhile. 2AC number uh, 2AC5. They said we don't define define what criminals. Yes, we do. With the first evidence in the one see the one see I said about 50 kilos of coke, and that that would be it. And then that's what would count. They said they say circumvention. No, circumvention doesn't matter. Durable fiat so all of their solves all of the offense, but it doesn't matter. I mean, when we do define it in our own solvents, yeah, okay, which is more than enough to check. Then 2AC number six, they said since the guidelines solve. No, this doesn't solve because even if they can get high level high level penalties, the one to see evidence I said that only mandatory minimums can send the clear signal proven by under the Obama administration, which 
proves all of their offense because this is a warrantless claim without any actual evidence. Seven, they said there's no evidence today. There's no evidence about the day side, but yes, there is. They said there's no evidence on how we solve drug problems. Yes, there is. I read that work above, but also this is just a warrantless understanding about how, how a warrantless claim about how we can't solve for drug trafficking without any piece of evidence. That actually, I say this, that picks bad. Our interpretations, if we get picks grounded in after literature, that's referable. Nine reasons. First, for reciprocity, they can run the crimes and picks out of the counter plan. Second, it's a better education. It makes the yeah, think carefully of what they put in their plan text. Teaches better plan writing. Second, it's not unfair. The negative sales to win a risk of the net benefit. Third, fourth, the yeah, FI is ground. They can run disadvantages based on using the mandatory minimums. Five, it makes for a better, a better policy debate. It allows for actually you have the best policy option. Congress people take bits and pieces out of bills all the time. Six, it's more real world. Congress policy debates are filled with counter plans that pick out of part of parts of bills. Seven, they eliminate all counter plans. It will prevent the neg from saying uh, from the neg from saying the USFG system that's in the plain text. Eight picks are essential to balance affirmative ground. The theory, the, the their theory forces neg to defend a bad status quo. Nine is not stealing. They have any intellectual property right to the plan. They could have they could have took their picks as a as the plain text. Reject the argument, not the team. The Page. Top level, they don't solve any of their scenarios. But they don't solve any of their scenarios coming out of the QAC, coming out of the QAC with a, a couple conceded solvency deficits. But I'm going to start with the Biden, the, the Biden solves the after Lopez evidence. I said that Biden's going to get $20 billion in grant programs to eliminate mandatory minimums. They said it's just a campaign promise, but they didn't answer that. Biden is planning on doing it in the, in the status quo and that he will do it eventually, which is more than enough of a reason to not risk the, to not risk the internal, to not risk the link on the disadvantage. If Biden will do it at some point, they said it's not on Biden's mind, but yet Biden's mind, yes, it is. That's the Lopez evidence. Biden, uh, uh, the Lopez evidence, it actually said Biden wants to do it in the status quo. And that was one of his major campaign promises that it's just a matter of time that he will actually do it that all causes they don't solve state they say state sentences that's 90 percent of offenders they said that they saw it because they would just go to federal court system but there wasn't a piece of evidence on why this was true or why anything would happen you should default negative when it's a status quo and it's how federal policy works that states determine what the sentences are but at the very worst this is just a reason why the states would increase sentences and conservative states would increase sentences to something past mandatory minimums and uh, past mandatory minimums and make these people's sentences drastically worse there's tons of all causes to the sentences which is the colon evidence which was fun actually dropped in the 2AC because their evidence was really bad. They just had the Healy evidence, but it doesn't even account colon, which actually is three strike laws. In other ways that legislators have removed these sort of sentencing restrictions. I say that people that three strike laws mean that you are always going to be in jail once you have three minor level crimes, which are functionally worse than a mandatory minimum anyway. But also the truth in sentencing laws, which I say that, uh, uh, actually, never mind. The, all this stuff I did above is more than enough for a reason on why this is solved. But those are the evidence was functionally conceded. They don't solve. They don't solve judicial. They don't solve racist judges. They, they, they don't solve racist judges. There are more than ever reason for why them to increase penalties for people who are, are increased penalties on mandatory minimums. They said that they said the Healy evidence that isolates how judges aren't racist, but the Healy evidence doesn't say that in the actual card. But empirics prove that judges will increase sense for people of color, especially people on drug crimes, just because they want to, not that they actually do anything. But also they don't solve plea bargaining. Other drug laws prevent them from being eradicated. That Yaffe evidence isolates that they're isolated that even if they do it. The other drug laws allow them to continue to use plea bargaining. The COVID evidence, the COVID thing, they don't solve it at all. Vaccines should have solved it. it. Evidence just describes past years about how federal prisons, which the app doesn't solve. Are you ready for cross -ups? Yeah. I want to start off on the pick. Your 1NC evidence has a quote that's like, it's time to get effective. Let's start prosecuting. What evidence do you think you've read that actually says mandatory minimums solve for international drug trafficking? Sure. That one, it's not about international, it's about to the US is what the evidence is, is what the internal benefit is about. But okay. second- What evidence do you think says that mandatory minimums solve for drug trafficking on any level? Yeah, that Zachary and 14 evidence, that's one that Alrathan in 18, which I said that this was an Obama era policy that Trump reversed, which caused an increase in drug trafficking. And you're, I said, you're correct that that was Obama policy. What card says that, like Obama policy did not end drug trafficking. What evidence says that mandatory minimums are capable of stopping drug trafficking? Sure. But this just says that many people are low level offenders. Our argument is that it's a decrease in some level and that just letting them free and just saying that there isn't any sort of like big sentencing, it will allow them to do it. It's just a question of matter of time of when this conflict happens. We say it's in the short term via the, uh, the, ev the second piece of evidence. So it isolates that this is just a matter of time. So we need to keep them in check uh, in the status quo. What, the, the, what, what is the warrant behind that? The Atherton evidence isolate that there was yeah. connected to a international. I, I'm reading the Atherton evidence and says that people won't get mandatory minimums unless they're connected to an international drug cartel. That person would get a high sentence under sentencing guidelines, 
why would that not be sufficient to prevent them from continuing to commit drug crimes? Yeah. So mandatory minimums set a sort of set, like a big picture. People see like, oh, mandatory minimums are pretty scary. The so, what, okay. People think mandatory good. minimums are scary. What evidence says that mandatory minimums are so scary that drug traffickers stop trafficking? Yeah. One, that Obama did it and then it had a decrease in drug trafficking to US. But the second- Where, is where does it say that? that? I'm trying to answer, but you keep cutting me off. But I'm asking, I, I know, but you're like, that's not true. What evidence says that the Obama policy actually reduced drug trafficking? It's, there was not a like federal, there was not an international drug ring. The evidence isolates, it literally says there was somebody who was interconnected with an international drug cartel. They used a weapon, then they were able to get off. It isolates. The, so like one worker in an international drug cartel was prosecuted. Where, yeah. Why do you think that I, makes the claim that mandatory minimums resolve cartel violence and trafficking more broadly? I think this is also kind of a question to like, uh, does the net benefit outweigh any like any that's not an answer to my question out. what evidence do you think makes a distinction between sentencing guidelines and mandatory minimums yeah the what is it the more housing evidence it isolates that the concern for public safety that like causes people to view mandatory minimums as like bigger as a bigger so that's that's congress's perspective how does this speak to the perspective of the people with an incentive no. to do drug trafficking I think you're sort of this like, is also from the Heritage Foundation, by the way. That's kind of a questionable source on deterrence. Yeah, but it like isolates. It is not just about Congress. I don't think you have like actually like. It, it says in Congress, Congress there are these types of concerns sure. about public safety. It's about broader, it's not the, the perspective of a drug trafficker. I've sent the one in our. Let me know when everybody has it. But the order is the disadvantage and then framing. Okay, does everybody have it and is everyone good? Okay, I'll start in like five seconds, absent rejection. Prosecuting January 6th rioters is necessary to recommit to our democracy. It shows that America will not stand by as certain members of our country attack the concepts most fundamental to our democracy. Without those prosecutions, we send a signal of weakness and failure globally, emboldening our adversaries to escalate skirmishes and undermine global human rights and peace efforts, efforts which outweighs. It also turns the affirmative. First, the link turns case. Challenges in federal court undermine resources and focus on expungement and re retrial for past sentences, meaning people are stuck in jail. Second is that an impact turns the case. Collapse of democratic values and rise of authoritarianism ensures collapse of typical notions of justice, which ensures further violence against people of color. On the uniqueness question, prosecutions of January 6th rioters are coming now, but require substantial time and effort, both of which are severely limited due to COVID-19. Any further expansion of federal court resources trades off with those prosecutions. That's the Thompson evidence. And prosecutions are coming now, but require significant resources in federal court. Any alternative to the status quo undermines justice and the rule of law. Reinwald and Angel in 617. Souther, Drumsey, Williams, and Meggs are among at least 464 charged in federal court for January 6. They're among 43 in Florida, 14 in Central Florida, and 10 in Tampa. They represent a microcosm of sorts to prosecutors who are working to resolve hundreds of cases that range from small to serious to seditious. There has been erosion of respect for government and for the rule of law. Federal courts deal with each case individually and not lump everybody together. Force these a coordinated effort from the government to sort defendants based on varying levels of involvement. And they're already, they've already been delayed, but require significant resources energy from Hosenball and 21. Few plea bargains in right cases, just one of them 440 charged pleaded guilty, a sign of tough conditions set by prosecutors. U.S. officials suggested in hearings that defendants might plead guilty, but more than a dozen said plea talks foundered, floundered because prosecutors demanded clients turn over social media data, phones, and other evidence pushing for sentences they would not accept. Without plea deals, hundreds of separate trials will move forward, a time-consuming process extended by a backlog from COVID-19. They say that cases are up now. Their evidence is a year old and is about the wrong court system. 
You should prepare evidence of prosecutors, prosecutions coming now and backlog ending because the evidence is from the past month and today and prices and their evidence. I did that work above. Onto the link. The plan causes substantial legal changes, which causes local agencies to fight the plan in federal court, clogging the system. That's the Weichelbaum evidence. They say that they can't fight the plan because our evidence was about state fighting. First, the affirmative not affecting sentencing states is a massive solvency deficit because every advantage card is about overall system, even if the inherency evidence in the 1AC isn't. Second is that it doesn't matter. The link evidence is not about states challenging laws, but civil litigants and local agents in order to change the law. And ending mandatory minimums would cause repeated litigation, Doyle and 13. Minimums are found in federal statutes. It attaches imprisonment to a crime of violence or drug trafficking, has been subject to a repeated court litigation and regular amendment. And congressional lit litigation on the affirmative would cause repeated litigation, congressional legislation on the affirmative would cause repeated litigations over small incremental changes, Keani and 17. A legislative hard shove might entrench the norm lawmakers crack down on social criminal behavior, case decisions of prosecutors and courts, apply new law and strengthen the predisposition their colleagues enforce the law. This pattern can be seen in other areas as well. Litigation strategies may pursue incremental changes that protect problematic societal norms. Onto the internal link. Failure to prosecute is an affront to democracy and sends a signal of the collapse of justice and democracy. That's the Brockler evidence. They say that the government can prioritize prosecution of capital rights over the fights of the plan. No, they can't. Litigation prevents it and delays every other case. Their diamond evidence doesn't assume the capital rights being uniquely destructive to democracy and perception, and that prosecution can massively strengthen democracy. Sure, Biden's victory didn't fix democracy, but prosecution overcomes the current flaws. The conclusion of the diamond evidence is the internal link and proves the time frame for the impacts is immediate. Democratic breakdown and retreat leads to authoritarian rise, which is already happening now. And strong, stable, and full prosecutions are necessary to resolve democracy and rule of law. Brockler in 21. What took place on January 6th was more of a reprehensible affront to democracy and government. It was criminal. Those involved should be thoroughly and vigorously prosecuted. We must encourage but celebrate prosecutions of those engaged in public lawlessness. The message to the world must be that best equipped country for peaceful transfer of power has zero tolerance for those groups. The law must not care about the subject matter as a justification for criminal behavior. That is the crux of the rule of law. The law must apply to everybody equally. The message sent from an arbitrary abdication of our commitment to the rule of law would be that violating laws is justified. Such a message might comfort future writers who want to express displeasure. On to framing. The counterplan and turns case arguments above obviate their offense, so you should massively air neg. But extinction outweighs. It threatens billions of present lives and future society, which is a prerequisite to their arguments. Extinction precludes the possibility for improvement, which turns their offense. Extend the Weiner evidence. We systematically neglect existential risks, so you should overcome this. Credible analysis requires reliance on predictions and consequences, so you should prefer extinction over probability. We have eight minutes. I'll start from now.
Snap prep. We've used 315. Okay. The order is going to be advantage framing, then the pick, and then the DA. Can I get a uh, verbal or non-verbal confirmation of everyone that they're good? Sounds good. In that case, give me one second to get my documents in shape, then I'm ready to begin. Cool. On case first, Biden is doing it right now. The campaign, they say Biden is doing it now. One, campaign promise for 2019 is insufficient. He has limited time, political capital, and focus that is spent elsewhere in the status quo. Two, the conceded congressional pushback means that Biden can't do it even if he wants to. Three, even if he gets states incentive that solves any state deficit, which proves, this proves the next argument. Two, they say can't solve states. One, this is an assertion without evidence, which is not carded in any point of the speech. Two, they have no statistics under how state Medicare minimum directly, which means that you should preserve resolving federal mandatory minimum. Federal mandatory minimum 1020 larger. Smith 19, the sentence is available in federal prosecutor, how those available in table court over 1020 higher mandatory minimum much harsher in the federal levels here to radically change their policy crime incarceration. They see all causes, no quantifiable impact to any of this. They don't suffer all incarcerations. The Barcovin explained that federal mandatory minimums are 50% of the federal prison population, which means we solve 100,000 people right now, which is net good. They consider that coal is on the state level and three strikes law, their mandatory penalties would be removed in the world of the plan. They say racist judges. One, this is an assertion without evidence. Two, the fit of evidence is comparative and empirical study. When we empower judges and prosecutors, racial disparities are mitigated, which should be preferred over well, the two NCA particular H without evidence. They, they always said they want them hard now, which proves the sentences are lower. Framing. Extend their model of risk analysis. You should balance probability and magnitude by evaluating both on a zero to 100 scale and evaluating two, which means that you should solve the evidence to be referred over near zero risk of the DA and internal benefit. One is logic. Treating magnitude is if they collapse in a subject and the action could solve the case of an any time sentence. They still face any which is the Kessler evidence. Two is future generations. They conceded the Kessler evidence that reducing structural is a violence, curve like a verbal fact of software accents or ways. They don't perhaps prevent stopping exchanges. Yes, that's one high probability of it, which just was their framework argument. And we don't over, don't also, you shouldn't overcorrect because bias is not true in the context of the debate, but people in the context of the debate where impacts are overrated and it's like judge intervention. The kind of one. At the top, there is absolutely no risk of internal net benefit. The first impact is that of instability, but the status quo descriptive does not make a claim about the plan being able to, that, about Ben's being able to evolve again, meaning just descriptive of the current contract values. The only other impact is that of climate change. This is new, so I get to redo impact defense here. No warming impact emissions are available. Curry 19, tipping points, including IC co-op, collapse of the Atlantic circulation, and permanent rest release at the rate of being exceptional unlikely. Some be taken literally the, the, the value of climate sensitivity the impact of the RCPP. It provides scenario is impossibly highest lower rate, meaning the more time these carbon dioxide the natural variability may be more likely to show that that man may warming under Paris to fall factually ameliorated. Mark that card at ameliorate, uh, ameliorated. Next is that warming gets lowered and it's like during area 18. Lamar said called warming dangerous. It's very, very misleading. I mentioned that one of the many causes is not primary for the contradict human activity. Carbon warming is not unprecedented, matched by the Roman period in medieval. No conclusive episode that warming has been exaggerated by mission models that proven to be wrong. Uh, uh, the rate is only half of uh, half confirmed by hundreds of papers that attribute warming to natural causes. Next, there is no internal net benefit, internal link. First, the framework is that they don't have any evidence that establishes that deterrence causal claim. Their sterling evidence just says that we should prosecute people, but it doesn't make the claim it would stop crime. The Zachary evidence just says that it wouldn't be, does not say that the Obama administration was successful whatsoever at stopping crime, just that they did so, but the fact that cartels increased over the Obama administration proved that it was net ineffective. On the final, the more evidence is just a description of the trans theory, but did not make claims of success. The lamb evidence is fantastic. It is a 117 study in meta-analysis that concludes that mandatory minimums not only have no effect on deterrence, but actually increase recidivism. It's the only risk of more crime in the world of the kind of ones. It means it should be the only empirical study done in this round. On solvency, one is circumvention. There is no definition of the legal bar for what a high level fighter would be. They did not highlight the thing about 50 kilograms, but it's not normal means. Also, it's not relevant because of the fact that prosecutors, because it's internal offense, that prosecutors can still arrest who they want. This matters because it means that people will still be prosecuted in the world of the when the prosecutor can still prosecute anyone under the uh, calling them quote a uh, low level uh, calling them quote a low level uh, high level drug offender. This is proven by the human rights evidence, uh, human rights watch evidence that explains that in the status quo, people who traffic drugs even they're being forced to do so, it had no valid intention, nor have any part of the organization structure are being prosecuted right now. It's proved that people get incarcerated through the, the drug offenses. The second difference is that this implies the plea bargaining. The fact that circumvention is so massive results in plea bargaining because it means that prosecutors threaten people with high mandatory minimums, even if they aren't actually high level offender. And the fact that they can do so means that people plead guilty, which is all the evidence about people getting put, put in jail for, for, for no reason. There's no internal benefit. There's by self deficit. The fact that they no worker for means that there should be a very low risk of prioritizing this kind of one. Uh, disadvantage. No links turns case. There's no explanation as to how slowing down everything would have any contextualization to prison balance. And our scenario outweighs massively on scope. There's also no in fact turns case because it relies on the DA winning and it's also not contextualized the prison balance on the unique debate. There is they've conceded that there is a status quo case back to COVID, which is our two ways the evidence. They have no card response that proved that there's no card which means that if anything, prosecution inevitable, prosecution being delayed is inevitable because courts don't have resources due to COVID. Their evidence just says that people will have resources to prosecute, but they don't have any evidence about that resources being available now, nor the plan would free up or damage those resources because there's no, 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 no
which means that you should have a very high threshold for voting on the GDX argument. On the link debate, one, there is no incentive to fight. This is the primary example of there not being a real link here. Their first one is the evidence is just about states resisting federal over enforcement, which is not the word of federal government, not the word of the plan, because it literally has nothing to do with state government, so no like, it would contest it. Their second link evidence is school descriptive and not about getting rid of mandatory minimum, just about how there are statutes that exist, which is not the same thing. If anything, getting rid of those statutes would be the opposite because the litigation is about the existence of the statute in the in the world that's which is all in the that's which is the only evidence. They have no real evidence here. It's that there should be a very high, uh, lo, lo, uh, a very low risk here. Next exam, the internal link. They have no evidence about why this is being key. They, they've conceded that the prosecutor can simply free resources from other platforms. And if it's so important, they'll do so anyways because they understand being part of the Democratic Federation, which has no response to prove that there's a hundred percent risk is occurring anyway because there's no warrant for it. They couldn't do so. Finally, on the image debate, the diamond evidence is fantastic. He talks about how things like pol politicalization of pol uh, politicalization of politics, structural transmedia, dissension, polarization, authoritarianism all cause net decrease in democracy. The response is that this is descriptive of their decision here, but this is not the case. Their evidence explains that things like Biden and these other broader trends make it impossible for the reserve to reverse the signal. Their, their, their internal link evidence is garbage. It just says that it would be good to prosecute people, but it doesn't mean they could reverse these structural trends that are degrading democracy. They have no, no, no internal solvency. 64. Can you send that those two warming cards out? They weren't in the original email. Oh, apologies. Yeah, for sure. They're sent.
Okay, the order is the decide, the pick, framing, the advantage. Is anyone not ready? Great. The diss we'll concede there's not a link we're not going for. There's no offense on the page that can be crossed by. The pick. Top level without an answer to the first, without an answer to one of the impact scenarios and with a marginal solvency deficit. It's an, if we want a 1% risk of the net benefit, then you vote affirmative because they have no evidence on why high level drug crimes or high level drug crime trigger all the impacts of the app, but the counterpoint solves the entirety of that for two. The counterpoint solves the entirety of the app. It has the mandatory drug. It has it ends. It ends mandatory minimums for all instances except for high level drug crimes, which is uh, high level drug crimes, which is more than enough to solve. If there's as a circumvent, which was the uh, first of the circumvention argument, no, they've conceded that durable fiat solves for all of this. That, 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 that fiat solves for all of the circumvention argument. There's no way that they could just be like, hey, no, we. Not doing that, but also they have conceded that our own evidence actually is that 50 kilos of coke. They said we didn't highlight it, but no, it's normal means. And high level drug offenses is a term of art. It is a, is a legal term of art, which means that they wouldn't be able to just be like, hey, look at this. It doesn't matter. Like, hey, look at this. They're going to be able to circumvent the counterplan. There also wasn't an extended as a reason on why circumvention matters or why circumvention means they don't solve the app. They just said the word circumvention instead of buzzword in hopes that you pull the trigger on it. The plea bargaining solvency deficit. No, this wasn't in the one. This wasn't in the 2AC. If you can draw a line from your flow in the 2AC to the one area, if you can't draw a line from your 2AC to the one you should strike this author flow and not allow a new two-way argument. But second, I'll answer it anyway, even if you think it's a legitimate argument. Even if you think it's a legitimate argument. Second, the the, the, the plea bargaining uh, the plea bargaining evidence that they read is the, the plea bargaining evidence that they read on the case page is plea bargaining for like one gram of marijuana or sure there's like one gram of marijuana or small amount of cocaine it says nothing about it it says nothing about the actual firm if there's no reason on why it would happen they just asserted that plea bargaining would be used but they also cannot use these sort of high level drug crimes because they know that if they don't have 50 kilos of coke that it won't be used in the first place it won't be used in the first place if they kind of solves a risk of the net benefit which all to work in a second it's more than enough of a reason for you to pull the trigger they pull, pull the trigger and vote negative and neg negative they, that Net benefit, drug, the, the, the net benefit, uh, high level, uh, what is it? Uh, drug, the, 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 the mandatory minimum self for drug trafficking. Drug trafficking causes war, which is the conceded impact scenario coming out of the one air. Drug trafficking causes international conflict, the, the international conflict, the regional hotspots, all like Panama, all proved that we're on the brink. It's just a question of time. It was a conceded impact, which means that it's going to cause extinction. That's a pretty sort of evidence that always on magnitude. Extinction, always with all that we're going to second. The problem is the second is probably, it's happening now. It, it, it is happening now. Regional hotspots prove, but they conceded too many turns case arguments that even if you win a solvency, I've said the impact to terminally always there from the first day. Uh, first, they conceded that in a world where that drug trafficking was causing a war and causing mass conflict. It would cause police officers to massively crack down on anyone who was on, on, on any sort of person who had drugs and caused it to the police to have an issue with tough on crime policies, which would trigger all of the impacts to the affirmative because people would still be arrested. But they also can see that people of color would be most affected in any time of nuclear works. So the governor gave it out. They only answer the warming impacts scenario, which is new in the one oh, new in the one hour. But this doesn't take account with the far quad evidence is hyper specific to war and ecological. Uh, there's hyper specific, hyper specific to nuclear war because of drug trafficking. The deterrence argument. Yes, we saw there's two made or there's two main arguments. They, they can see the Zachary and for the second piece of Zachary evidence that I've read in the 2C, which is an external solvency mechanism on why the counterpoint solves. It actually said the counterpoint's restructuring frees up more resources that it's also to target drug it to target drug offenders and allows us to target. And it was the FBI to it was the FBI to increase your criminalization of drug trafficking. Uh, drug trafficking I actually said we had I actually said we'd be able to increase a lot of uh, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, it actually said that would free up funding for more effective uses and uh, not uh, for uh, uh, effective uses than the most serious and dangerous drug offenders would still be on the focus of law enforcement, which is more than a reason. But the deterrence, yes, the lame evidence does not say what they wanted to say. The lame evidence says that, yes, it is. Yeah, I will admit it is a survey. It, that is a study. It, it is a scientific study, but it's about low level drug crimes. That is what their only evidence is about. But they have conceded the Alther, uh, the Alfredson evidence, which sucks. It is, a, is an Obama era policy that was solving in some level and was decreasing a uh, some level of drug trafficking. Uh, uh, Drug, uh, drug trafficking, which was reversed by Obama, which means that even if it doesn't matter, they have not read a solvency deficit specific to this function of the pick, which means that terminally outweighs the app. If a 1% risk of extinction, which they've conceded, then you vote affirmative, or then you vote negative on the counterpoint. Without a, per without a permutation extended, it does not matter if there isn't an internal link to the pick, or if it doesn't solve the app. So you vote app framing.
Dave can see that counter plans obviate all of their offense on framing because it proves that they are, we have intentions of resolving their violence. I mean, that even if all of their evidence applies, it does not matter. They extended Casmic, but it wasn't in the 2AC. No evidence of the African solve extinction or people who the app reduces sensei for will develop technology or so solve extinction. But also, we solve this because we solve for it uh, better because people will not die in a nuclear war, which allows people to save more things. But you should prioritize the extinction. It outweighs the threats billions of people in future society, which is a prerequisite to all of their offense extinction, but who's the possibility for improvement, which turns all of their arguments, even if you agree that their argument, the counter plan solves their offense and you still vote negative and you still be negative without a reason on why you should reject utilitarianism and reject evidence you default to order besides society which is like society can get better it's just a question of time it's just a question of time which means that prioritizing society is the most important thing in the debate which kind of fun does okay uh we have 4 45 left which i will start
Okay, the order is going to be the case overview, framing, and then the counterpoint. Oh, could I get confirmation from everyone? Awesome. Reducing mass incarceration through mandatory minimums should be your utmost priority in this round. The Haney evidence says that prolonged incarceration as a result of mandatory minimums has severe mental and psychological has consequences because people are subject to extreme levels of violence and dehumanization in prison. The Snyder evidence says that mandatory minimums are a particularly bad form of this violence because they separate families and communities for such long periods of time that people are unable to return into their families and end up committing future crimes. The Burkhalter evidence says that reducing prison populations now is uniquely important because they become incubators for the spread of COVID-19. All of these arguments prove that you should not risk having additional people go into prison as a result of the vague counterplan. Framing. The negative has functionally conceded our, our model of risk analysis. Balance probability and magnitude by evaluating both on a 1 to 100 scale and multiplying the two together. Full concession of case means we are winning full probability and all impact framing arguments prove why we would win a high magnitude as well. That means that solvency deficits should be preferred over near zero risk of the internal net benefit. That's best for logic. The Kessler evidence explains that treating magnitude as infinite collapses in on itself because any action has some risk of extinction and any risk times infinity is still infinity. They've also conceded our Kazimierz evidence throughout this round that reducing structural violence curbs negative ripple effects to solve for existential risks, which means that we access their 1% risk framing as well. The counterplan doesn't access our framing because we will win that it does not solve for our AF, and the fact that extinction would kill a lot of people doesn't access our framing either if we disprove their impact. The counterplan. The fact that there is no risk of deterrence and they're losing the framing page obviates their 1% risk framing. The impact size doesn't matter if they can't access it in the first place. First is circumvention. There is no definition of what constitutes a high level offense. Their evidence says maybe 50 kilograms of cocaine would be serious, but it establishes no clear threshold for every single type of offense. That means that Congress can reasonably still leave many mandatory minimum charges in place. Prosecutors can in turn still apply many of these charges to people. Even if the charges don't necessarily apply, the Human Rights Watch evidence describes the way that prosecutors coerce defendants in plea bargaining negotiations. Defendants wouldn't necessarily know that these mandatory minimums only apply to low level of, to high level offenders and therefore would still be scared by the threat of a mandatory minimum sentence and accept a guilty plea. This may seem like sort of a far-fetched solvency deficit, but the fact that they have no evidence on deterrence means even a low risk of a solvency deficit should outweigh the internal net benefit. Next, there is no risk of deterrence. You should read the LAM evidence after because it is fantastic. It gives two warrants. First, mandatory minimums cannot deter crime. It says that deterrence is a function of certainty being caught, not the length of a sentence. When a major drug trafficker is considering a crime, they don't say, how long is the mandatory minimum? Rather, they consider the benefits that they would gain as a result. Mandatory minimums don't increase the likelihood they're caught by the police, which means they can't prevent that crime from happening in the first place. Second is recidivism. The longer a person spends in prison as a result of mandatory minimums, the more likely they are to return to crime after they are released because they're less able to reintegrate into their families and communities. That means that leaving in place some mandatory minimums increases the risk of crime. I have read through every single piece of their evidence on deterrence, and none of it claims that mandatory minimums stop drug trafficking. To vote negative, you have to point to a specific piece of evidence that makes the claim that mandatory minimums can or will solve for drug trafficking. The Sterling evidence just says that Congress needs to send a message and that we shouldn't focus on small potatoes. The first Zachary evidence just notes that most people in prison are level level offenders. The Atherton evidence says that mandatory minimums were applied to drug traffickers, but not that they successfully reduced trafficking or had a deterrent effect. Their only piece of evidence is the second Zachary evidence, but all it says is that reducing low-level offenses frees up resources to prosecute drug trafficking. The AF accesses that as well because it eliminates mandatory minimums altogether, which allows the Department of Justice to prosecute whomever they want. The Mulhausen evidence is just a Heritage Foundation hack saying that retribution is a good idea and provides no statistics. All of that means sentencing guidelines can solve because we don't say that people don't get prosecuted whatsoever, but that mandatory minimums uniquely are bad. Turns case does not matter when they're not accessing any of their impact 
but it's also uncarded and uncontextualized to our scenarios. Their evidence was answered in the 1AR as being status quo descriptive and from 2007, which means there's an extremely low risk of escalation. None of their evidence says that mandatory minimums end all trafficking, ends all warming, or reduce conflict, which means they don't get access to any of their impacts, even if in theory they should outweigh. Great. Good debate. Good debate. Good job, everyone. Congrats. One of the judges might be unmuted, by the way. My bad.
Uh, hey, everyone. Seems like I'm always the last person. So I'm in now. Um, so if the other judges just want to check to make sure that their decision is correct, as always, we're waiting on Eric to get his life together and come back to the computer screen. Odo, where are you? <laughs> What's up, buddy? <laughs> no, I had to mess with you. Sorry, I, no, I know. I went to go get a little food. <laughs> Okay, so it seems, do the other judges mind since I'm already unmuted? Okay, perfect. All right. Once again, congratulations to both teams. This was an excellent, excellent debate. Just going to plug myself as a topic author. You all did the topic a huge service in terms of debating it like real talk. Um, that being said, it was a 5-0 decision for the affirmative. Uh, so I'll go first. Like I said, excellent oh, debate. Wait, uh, just one second. We gotta, I have to wait uh, for confirmation that the live stream ended before we can do the RFD, sorry. Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs>